you. Um, my name is Richard D. St. Lazaro. I am your host for this evening. It is time to pedestrianize this. Welcome. Um, everyone take a seat, find a space to settle in. I do want to note at the top that this uh, the program portion of tonight will be recorded and hopefully made available online, so keep your heckles high quality. Um, I was so excited to be invited by Gordon and the SNG gang to be part of this evening. Um, I do represent a sponsor, but I'm also just someone who lives here and really enjoy um, my neighbor, my central district neighborhood Greenway, my state healthy street, and I really enjoy a beer on a sidewalk cafe. So I'm profoundly excited to hear about the vision that we're going to discuss tonight. Um, as we start the program, I'd like to acknowledge that we gather tonight on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, the first people of Seattle, and specifically the Duwamish people past and present. Um, we honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe, and I would also like to express gratitude to El Centro for the use of this space at Centilia Cultural Center. Yeah. yeah. But this is not a box check. Land acknowledgement needs to continue throughout the evening. This is a conversation about the future of Seattle's shape, and this conversation won't succeed if we don't root it in an acknowledgement and an honoring of our, of our past and our heritage. Um, it is fitting that tonight is hosted by Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. If you are on the SNG board or staff or head up one of the many groups in the coalition, please give us a wave. And to the rest of us, we all have. For more than a decade, SNG has led the way to make, um, to make every neighborhood in Seattle a wonderful place to bike and walk and live, guided by the values of safety, equity, and sustainability. Um, tonight is the first of a series. We kick off uh, SNG's Shaping Seattle series, um, a number of events over the course of the year to activate on key issues impacting the city. But tonight, we are talking about how to build pedestrian streets in every neighborhood in Seattle. Um, sorry, the, the ringtone, I had to come with it. Um, that's a bold vision, every neighborhood in Seattle, but it's a very doable one because it's a good vision. As we're going to hear tonight, this is good for old people, young people, businesses, residents, visitors, the economy, the planet. It is a win, 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 and those ideas are always feasible with enough work. Now tonight would not be uh, excuse me, let me talk about what tonight is before I talk about who sponsored it. Um, tonight is in three parts. First, we're going to take a trip uh, around the world and find out about how other places around the world have created great pedestrian space. Then we will dive into the work here with a panel of experts who have been doing this work right here in Seattle. And then finally, we'll get to mingle and hang out and most exciting, actually talk about how to engage each of you in this work um, and bring this vision to life. So, with that, would not be possible without an amazing list of sponsors. Um, let's hold a pause, because again, we're on time, but then let's give a rousing round at the end to the Seattle Department of Transportation, Fleming Law, Lime, GCN, Mute Seattle, WSP, and Alta Planning and Design. Give us a round of applause, then. And I have to mention my very own Expedia, but I, did, I was on last, so I didn't want to say it on the offense. Um, these sponsors are not only making tonight possible, but the entire Shaping Seattle um, series. So we look forward to seeing them and you all throughout the year. So um, with that, first up, we're taking you on a short world tour. Now, um, when, I was, when I was five, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I'd say like a dinosaur. Um, and now I kinda, I'm a lobbyist, and I, what I should have said was I want to be Jeff Howe. Um, Jeff Howe is a professor of landscape architecture and the director of the Urban Commons Lab at the University of Washington. As part of his research, he's traveled extensively to study urban spaces in Asia, and at home, he's engaging, to, he's engaging students to envision pedestrian spaces here in Seattle, especially the U District. Uh, I'm excited to see where he takes us over the next few minutes. Jeff. Thank you for the introduction, uh, and no wonder Expedia is sponsoring this. <laughs> okay, um, well, thank you uh, to Seattle Neighbor Greenway uh, for this wonderful opportunity to speak uh, at this event uh, in the next eight minutes. 
uh, I'd like to, uh, to take you to some of my favorite streets in Asia to talk about the relationship between uh, street density and civic life. But first, you're looking at an aerial view of a neighborhood in Seattle. Anyone recognize this? You don't. You district. You district, you're right. Uh, so we're looking at the future of the neighborhood uh, with a projected total of 22 new towers and 5,000 units in the next few years. Uh, in other words, it's going to be a, a much denser neighborhood in the future, and not just a few district, but um, in many other neighborhoods in Seattle. As the new towers are being built, uh, as you can see in the background, uh, most of our urban infrastructure, especially streets, however, remain the same. Northeast 42nd Street that you're looking at here, for example, uh, even with the higher density, our urban environments remain predominantly auto-centric, precluding the kind of uh, urban uh, vibrancy that uh, is commonly associated with higher density. And not just streets, but also alleyways. Uh, here's the one behind the app. Uh, so how can we leverage the higher density uh, in the future uh, in Seattle to make our city and neighborhoods more active and livable? How can we leverage density to activate places like this? Uh, to search uh, for examples for high density cityscape, uh, there are probably no better places uh, than Asia uh, to, uh, to look for, uh, such as Tokyo. Uh, so here is an aerial view of Asakusa, which is a neighborhood in the center of the city. Some of the most memorable uh, places in Tokyo are streets without cars. Uh, such as Nakamise Dori uh, dates back to the 17th century, uh, leading to the Sensoji Temple in Asakusa, uh, one of the most prominent temples in Tokyo uh, that you're looking at here. Such as the many pedestrian side streets in Ameriko in Ueno, uh, streets that, that you appreciate life in the dense urban environments uh, with all the history, convenience, and conviviality. Uh, such as Takeshita uh, Dori in Harajuku, a popular place for young people in Tokyo that is always packed with uh, folks on uh, weekends, where the streets is where the character of a place uh, really comes alive. A uh, picture with cosplayers on the right uh, was a student of mine uh, who had a great time that day. <laughs> uh, it's important to note that uh, most of these examples uh, you know, examples in Asia did not just occur naturally or uh, randomly. Instead, they were deliberately designed. The pedestrian streets network in Taipei, uh, Ximandin, for example, uh, that you're looking at here is a case in point. Uh, the, pedestrian, uh, the pedestrian street network was first established in 1998. And they actually did not get it right in the first time. Uh, so the streets were redesigned a decade later along with a push to better organize the merchants in the area uh, to coordinate garbage collection and so on. The result has been a phenomenal success. Uh, the redesign not only revitalized the commercial and uh, entertainment district, but also turned it into a mecca for young people, as well as tourists from overseas. And the streets are always packed with people, especially in the evenings, as you can see here. New Saddam Gil, located in the center of Seoul, uh, was redesigned from 1990 to 2000, turning an area known for antique and traditional arts into a hub for galleries and art uh, spaces uh, that attract many visitors. The uh, cityscape uh, with this beautiful street canopy, as you can see here, are also part of the attraction. Uh, by opening the streets to pedestrians, uh, many more activities can be accommodated that in turn make the streets more vibrant, the spaces for vendors and performers you can see here. Uh, in Sarongyo was redesigned as a shared streets, meaning that is a pedestrian streets on weekday, uh, on, week, uh, on weekdays, uh, uh, sorry, on weekends, and open to uh, traffic on weekdays. Uh, but even when there's uh, car traffic, you can see that the curbless street design uh, has been uh, able to kind of slow down the traffic and make the streets more friendly to the pedestrians. We cannot visit Seoul without going to uh, Dong Sukyun uh, Do Dam Gyo. It's a, a street along the wall of a former palace uh, that was redesigned in the 1990s and extended in 2017. 
the place has served as backdrop to many movies and Korean TV dramas. You, have, you might have seen these. Uh, and it's one of the most beautiful places uh, in the city, as you can see here, uh, with the stone walls and magnificent tree uh, uh, canopies and shades uh, here. On the row right, you see a before picture of what it looked like before, uh, street uh, packed with cars. Uh, what a contrast. More and more streets in Asia are uh, being uh, pedestrianized today. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, recent example is the Haji Lane in Singapore. The uh, pedestrianization started in 2013 uh, with a temporary uh, uh, street closure. And, uh, and it's, has since, uh, this street has since been named by the Time Out magazine as one of the top 10 coolest streets in the world. And you can see here, uh, it has such a human scale uh, compared to the tall uh, high-rise building around it. As we have seen in many of these examples here, sometimes it's not so much about the physical design of the streets, but more about how they are programmed for activities. In Taipei, for example, night markets have been an important part of the city life. Uh, here you see street packed with vendors and customers but during the day, uh, the same street can be used differently. The vendors usually don't get uh, set up uh, until late afternoon. In Hong Kong, the same streets that uh, serve the white collar workers in the financial district on weekdays are used by foreign domestic workers on weekends, uh, turned the street into vibrant gathering spaces. Streets that are uh, used for work and mobility now become a place of performance, connectivity, and connection. Uh, and conviviality. Here's a picture of people dancing uh, on the streets. A pedestrian paradise has been a program in Tokyo uh, that dates back uh, to the 1970s that takes place in different parts of the city. And uh, this is the one in Ginza where you can see uh, the barriers kind of organized very neatly. They can tell that we're definitely in Tokyo. The uh, Pedestrian Paradise program uh, in Tokyo is basically a pop-up event even uh, before it, there was such a thing called a pop-up event. A uh, program like this do not require a huge amount of investment but can go a long way in activating a neighborhood social and, and economically. Uh, pedestrian, uh, pedestrianization can bring many benefits to the city. Uh, but we also need to keep in mind that not all pedestrianization is necessarily good uh, for cities and neighborhoods. In Shanghai, for example, entire neighborhood had been uh, uprooted to make way for pedestrian malls. This is uh, Shintian uh, redevelopment, where uh, a formerly working class neighborhood has been uh, uh, displaced and gentrified. A model that has been uh, spread into other cities in Asia, uh, in, in China, including uh, Shenmen in Beijing, also a working class neighborhood uh, that has been put, uh, transformed into a shopping. So now back to Seattle, and this is my last slide. Uh, and the aerial view that we saw in the beginning, we know that Seattle is not Asia. Uh, and we have our own set of challenges and opportunities. But nevertheless, as the city, as the city begins to densify, it's important that we uh, turn the density into assets uh, to transform our neighborhood into safer, more prosperous, and more lively places. And I hope the example that I shared today can help you imagine how our city can be transformed. Thank you. This doesn't just have to be done, it has to be done well and correctly. Um, next up on our world tour, uh, we're going to be taken away by Mark Ostrom. Mark is on the board of SNG and also is active in Queen Anne Greenways. You may know him from his intimidatingly good Twitter feed where he shows us our you know, why we love bollards and pedestrian streets around the world. Um, locally, he is involved with an effort to pedestrianize Crockett Plaza. Mark, your time begins. Thank you, Richard. Hi, everyone. So, um, four years ago, I had an experience that completely changed the way I think about cities. Uh, it was inspired by this article in City Lab called In Car to Brussels, The Pedestrians Are Winning. Now, I had never been to Brussels, but I was familiar with the term Brusselization. So Brusselization refers to the introduction of high-rises and freeways into a traditional European urban context. 
there's probably no city more Brusselized than Brussels. Um, it's full of cars, and it looks like an American city in a lot of ways. But now Brussels is doing a complete U-turn. This is a map of Brussels. Uh, the green and blue areas are the parts that are being pedestrianized. Uh, the arrows show how service vehicles move through the space. So I was inspired to see this firsthand. So I went to Brussels, um, and what I saw happening there was remarkable. They took the main arterial street running through the middle of town, and they turned it into this, uh, which is amazing. So this is not AI. Um, the, photo, the photo on the left is what it used to look like. And the photo on the right is the picture that I took. Once you see how cars have radically changed our landscape, you can't unsee it. But as Brussels is showing, you can undo it. So at the end of uh, Boulevard Anspach is the Place de Bricaire, which is kind of like the Times Square of Brussels. This used to be choked full of cars. You can see that on the left. Uh, but now it's a big pedestrian plaza where you can let your kids run free. Uh, when, I, when I posted this on Twitter, uh, one person said, and I quote, the ideology is lovely, but the reality is that those homes, shops, and restaurants need deliveries. Uh, so yes, uh, even when you show an actual photograph of an actual pedestrian street that actually exists. People will say it's a pipe dream that can't possibly function. Do they need deliveries? Yes, yes they need deliveries and they get deliveries. Smart people have figured it out. So that's a piece of the presentation I was going to give. Um, I was gonna call it Going Big in Brussels. Uh, remember, uh, this was 2019. So I returned home after that trip in 2019 and joined a team planning a little event that we were going to call Pedestrianize This. Um, we set a date for this event in early 2020. Uh, anyway, stuff happened, and uh, I never gave that presentation in 2020. Uh, but what I did do uh, when it was safe was go back to Europe, and I went in search of other cities like Brussels. I started in Antwerp and worked my way to Zagreb, literally from A to Z. And I discovered that pedestrian streets are wildly popular in every corner of the globe. And not just streets, but entire zones, entire networks of streets. I visited over 30 pedestrian zones across Europe. Pedestrian zones are wildly popular in cities big and small. Density helps, but population doesn't matter. Madrid is a giant city, and Keswick is a small town. But their pedestrian zones really don't look that much different. Pedestrian zones are wildly popular in, in, in neighborhoods in old and new. So Vienna is building a brand new neighborhood called Seastad. There's a picture of it right here. It's not fully pedestrianized, it's not, not fully populated, but it already has a very large pedestrian zone. Pedestrian zones are wildly popular with kids. Instead of putting cars at the center of every street and squishing people up along the edges, we can put people at the center. Imagine that. So I'm probably biased uh, because I am a person, but <laughs> I like the idea of people at the center. On my trip, I was fortunate to meet people involved in pedestrianizing streets across Europe. I met with the deputy mayor of Ghent and the mayor of Ljubljana, uh, and I met with Jan Gale of Copenhagen, who's been at this since 1962. The people who, have, who pedestrianize cities, they have a certain vibe, like a person who took a risk that paid off lavishly. The mayor who pedestrianized uh, the core of Ljubljana um, has been elected five times. He pedestrianized it early in his first term, and he's still mayor. Um, I don't believe that Ljubljana wants a new mayor. <laughs> so I've said this before, but pedestrian streets are wildly popular in every corner of the globe. So what about Seattle? Currently, if you want a pedestrian street, 
The process is to fight SDOT. Normal people don't have the capacity to do that. But what if the process wasn't to fight SDOT, but to partner with SDOT? What if pedestrian streets were already on the menu of options? Here's Seattle's menu. It's a list of streets from Streets Illustrated. Uh, what do you notice about all of these streets? Cars are at the center of all of them. So that's one thing that needs to be fixed. Uh, once you have a menu, you need some recipes. What if we developed standard plans for bollards, traffic circulation, emergency access, and deliveries? What if we shifted budget from filling potholes on car streets to emptying trash cans on pedestrian streets? So here's a new menu, one that includes pedestrian streets. Now what if SDOT reached out to every neighborhood, working with the community to identify opportunities for pedestrian streets and public plazas? These are all normal things in every corner of the globe. And so I'd like to propose that we make this a normal thing here in Seattle. Thank you. Aditi is the urban design manager for SDOT and a leader within the, uh, within the Seattle community when it comes to rethinking our streets. Um, Aditi, lead the panel discussion. Thank you. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Aditi. I'm the urban design manager at SDOT, and everything Mark said is essentially my work program for the rest of my life. Um, I'd love, to, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to all the community projects represented here today from um, Capital Eco District, Bike Place for People, there is the Patio in Columbia City, Thomas Street, uh, Connecting Seattle Center and Southern Q Union, way back there's the Northeast Projects at 42nd Avenue and the Ave, um, and then Ballard Avenue in the Northwest. And, each of these projects is doing tremendous things to help us move the needle, to challenge us, to inspire us, um, to make change happen. And it's more art than science, I can tell you that much. Um, a warm welcome to the three panelists who are joining me here today in three projects. Um, to begin with, Yes Segura from Smash the Box, <laughs> talking about Beacon Hill, and the streets for people, and our cars. Erin Fry from Capitol Hill Eco District <laughs> talks about prioritizing pedestrians on bike and bike. And then last but definitely not the least, Debbie <laughs> Foster from Uptown Alliance, who chairs the Urban Design Framework Committee for Thomas Street Read Apart. Um, this is this is good, this is good. Um, so we have a sort of not a lot of time and quite a few questions, and these are all really incredible projects. Um, so I wanted to kick it off with just, you know, I find it really inspiring to hear community members describe what projects mean to them. So if you all could just go around and introduce your project and its vision and sort of why is it personally important to you? Sure. Yeah, so I'm Debbie Frosto and Uptown Alliance is a community organization. Um, some of you may know it as Lower Queen Anne, but we don't call it that anymore. Um, but Uptown Alliance is all volunteers, it's been around for about 20 years, and uh, we've done a lot of transportation projects. So if you've ever taken the Thomas Street Bridge to the waterfront, we were really keen getting the funding for those kinds of things there. Thank you. Um, so um, we uh, got involved here with Thomas Street, and for us, we're really collaborators in our community. And when the um, I-99 tunnel was being, we were all in different meetings and things like that, and suddenly the light bulb went off in a lot of our, our brains, Gordon being one of them, and we all went, the tunnel's going to reconnect Seattle east to west on Thomas Street, on Harris Street. It's really not a nice place right now. What if? What if Harrison is the cars and Thomas becomes the pedestrians? And so that led us... Um, to really start to ask some fun questions, which are 
coming out, you're going to see, are, are designed and almost ready to be Im implemented here. And, um, and I'll leave it at that. There's a lot of other things that went on, but we went, we went for a bike ride. I mean, that's what we did. That's what you do in a community, right? Gordon got, got us together with our council member, uh, Bagshaw, and we went off for a bike ride, and the idea started at that time. I'm Erin Freed. I'm the deputy director of the Capitol Hill Eco District, which has been around now for about 12 years. Um, we're a community organization headquartered in Capitol Hill, Seattle. And for the past few years, we've been working on a public life project. Um, with funding from the Seattle Department of Transportation, we've done some baseline studies using the GELT protocol and have just completed our community engagement, really looking at the public spaces in Capitol Hill and how they can best support community needs. And uh, pedestrian prioritization of the Pike Pine Corridor is our next step in implementation. Great, hello, hello. My name is Yes Sigwuna. I use he, they pronouns. I'm the founder of Smash the Box, which is an urban planning and design firm based out of Beacon Hill. Uh, so welcome to our neighborhood. And um, I'm with the, the project of redesigning streets for people, not cars, in Beacon Hill, where we're looking to close down the street off to cars and pedestrianize it. Um, I get to sit here essentially every single day when I grab coffee uh, from the station, and I see people almost get hit. Um, I've almost gotten hit, and I would like to see, uh, you know, working in this community, a, a safe and healthy street, especially after seeing what has happened during the pandemic with SDOT um, helping to create stay healthy streets, I think we can take it a step further. And with Smash the Box, we're um, working to gain uh, community input and working with uh, Tomorrow over here on helping to get this initiative started. So, um, you know, I heard safety, I heard public life and reconnection and connection, right? As sort of themes that are driving you in, in your work you know, spearheading a community project after your day job or other life life that you might have is a huge undertaking. Um, and of course, just wondering, you know, how do you start building a coalition or energy around a project? How do you get something off the ground? Um, and how, you know, what, just, yeah, love to hear. Anybody want to wall in too, Debbie, maybe? Start oh, with you. over there. We'll All right. <laughs> yes, but yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, as mentioned, this is something that has just begun. Um, it's something that I've been documenting, actually, if you follow me on uh, Blitz Urbanism on Twitter, you can see all the times that Sound Transit has been parking their vehicles um, on the sidewalk. And it's just taking up, it's taking up space where people in this neighborhood um, don't have access to. And where you're forcing people to be in the street where there's um, ongoing traffic and understanding, you know, if we're going to be reaching Vision Zero by 2030, we need to actually start making some change happen. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was good. Thank you. Um, yeah, so in Capitol Hill, you know, and looking at uh, how we share public spaces, uh, we did a lot of thinking about who they're for and, um, and who's taking care of them. And um, part of what we looked at um, were what are the needs that people are bringing with them into the public spaces um, that are, you know, where we might have expectations of, of how our needs might be met in those public spaces, or we might just not have a way of having our needs met. So we wanted to better understand what those needs were, and we looked at eight social determinants of health, um, everything from housing to safety to food security, um, and really tried to study what, was, what are our systems of resilience in our community and what's missing? Um, and some of the things that we learned were that, you know, in the northern part of the neighborhood uh, versus the southern part of the neighborhood where the Pike Pine Corridor is, uh, the median household income is double. So that means that people have very different resources um, and maybe different solutions for having their needs met because of that. We also heard from small businesses who were really on the edge of a cliff before the pandemic and wow, did they have a tough time. I think we all know that um, during the pandemic. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of triple net leasing, but in Seattle, if you're a small business owner, 
you pay not only your rent, but you also pay for insurance, for maintenance, and property taxes. And that can mean that it's very difficult to even become a small business. So we think about who we want to not just be in our public spaces, we want everybody to feel comfortable in them, but we also want people to be able to participate, and we'd like for there to be more racial diversity, more economic diversity in this community that is just above where the red line ran. So we're really thinking about not just who is here, but who could be, um, and bringing those people together and really having a clear understanding of their needs um, and, and trying to establish better connections so that people can hear each other. Thank you, Erin. Um, I think investing in place is sort of the, the theme, right? And place includes the street, the public life, the businesses, and supporting all of that to move the needle, yeah. Debbie? Uh, thank you. One of the things that um, when we started to really look at Uptown and talk to people, what we realized is we are a downtown neighborhood. We, we were, for a long time, associated with Magnolia and Queen Anne, but we have rentals. We have no single family zone land. We have um, the, the old brick buildings that are actually affordable rent because there's no parking spaces, there's no swimming pool. There may not be a washer and dryer in the unit even. And so there's a variety of things in there. And so being um, walkable, bikeable, transit-oriented um, community is really important to us. Um, on the other hand, we also had some of the social needs that were happening with downtown. And so we needed to be able to connect with those things there. So when we got together um, and we started talking about it, and we were kind of talking a little bit more about you know, Thomas Street and what might happen there, some of the things we started thinking about was that um, because of the east-west connection grid that was happening, there was an opportunity. There was an opportunity to get people to move differently through our city than they've been able to move before. And we wanted to capture that before they developed new habits. And how, do we do, how, how can we do that? How, what would those dreams look like? Um, we were really two emerging communities in some ways when you think about old, older communities in Seattle and that's South Lake Union and uh, uptown. How do we connect them? How do we connect them with Belltown? Uh, people don't care when you cross from one city or one neighborhood to another city. They want that street to walk, they, uh, to work, they want it to be green, they want it to be safe. They don't care. And here we had a connection between the two. We have Seattle Center. We have 12 million visitors a year into our neighborhood. That's four times the amount of people that go to Yellowstone Park in a year. Those are just visitors that come to our neighborhood. They don't want to drive, and we don't want them to drive. We'd rather that they have a safe green spot to be their bike or ride. So we started to develop these values and shared visions, and then we, we talked to people. We talked to Greenways. We talked to the businesses that are in there. We were, had big ones. We had REI. We had Facebook, and we had small ones. We came to the city. And we weren't sure about SDOT. But you know what? This is one project that SDOT said, wow, this is kind of neat. And we went, really? And they're like, yes. And so um, we just started running with it. We running with charrettes and getting a lot of visionary work doing there. And it was those shared values between all the different stakeholders that once we had that, um, it was going to be hard to stop us. Um, you know, I think um, just goes into sort of the opportunities and challenges that you all have all sort of navigated. Um, yes, I'm wondering your idea sort of just germinating for the, the streets here. What do you see as the biggest challenges and opportunities? Well, I have already started working. Well, one, um, we just won our first contract uh, with Special Ops with Seattle Department of Transportation. I'm working on, thank you. Uh, I know, I'm, and especially, I, I forgot to mention this, but I'm first generation of Salvadorian American and openly trans man. It's the reason why I started my business, because I kept facing discrimination when it came to the job sector. And you know, after um, the, essentially the Black Lives Matter protests and civil rights movement number two, that's when people wanted to stop hiring me. And I said, no, I'm not gonna be your diversity hire. So with the work that we're doing with Smash the Box, you know, making sure that we're, um, we're multidisciplinary, we're community driven, we're focusing on equity and health, we're actually walking the talk. 
And what I've noticed is that within our neighborhood that we're focusing on and doing the community outreach and policy recommendations for a Seattle transportation plan is that there's actually a bike project, a bike, a protected bike lane uh, project that's in the works that's on 15th Avenue uh, South, but going north. As you can see, there's um, a, a bike lane that's going south into our neighborhood. Um, but with the outreach, we made sure to try to reach out to the, the past community organizations that have been involved uh, within the neighborhood and also some new ones. And with that, we found that you know there are some pro-car people that are living <laughs> in our neighborhood. And so that's, um, you know, they're saying that there's not enough parking spaces and that the parking needs to be right in front of their house. But um, understanding that if we're going to, uh, like one, understanding like 60% of our greenhouse gas emissions in Seattle 2020 come from cars and trucks. So if we're going to be creating these livability or livable cities um, and having healthier cities uh, within our community, that we're going to need multiple modes of transportation. And that's one thing that, I, I, um, uh, that we're already seeing is that there's going to be pro-car people. Just did it. challenging um, when it feels like folks don't realize they have the same goal because they have different solutions in mind to, to get there. And I think helping people to remember that what we're really trying to do is essentially create more opportunities for connection, to have safer places to, to move through, and for our public spaces to really be for the people, um, that they need to be for everybody in that case. Um, helping people to understand that uh, you can be attached to the goal, but if you can let go a little bit of the path along the way and not be so certain that your way is right or the only way, I think most of the time if we're able to sit together and identify the challenges, they're, they're, oh, you can overcome them. One of the things that I hear a lot is, well, we can't have pedestrian-focused uh, streets in Capitol Hill because we don't have enough transit. This is a neighborhood that has so many modes of transportation <laughs> coming through it and passing by each other. Um, that that couldn't possibly be the problem. Maybe the problem is how they inter are integrated or uh, how our wayfinding it works in Capitol Hill or in the rest of the city. How easy is it to say no to a car or to say yes to a bus? What keeps people from making those choices? And can we think more about our systems so that when somebody says they have a need we don't need to be dismissive of that. We can just work together to come up with a different way to get to our goal. Yeah, it, not on Thomas Street, but being here with, uh, with Greenways, one of the first collaborations that we did in Uptown was we had to push the button to cross the street. And we're on Mercer. And you had to wait a long time, and there are a lot of streets, and nothing ever was lined up. The street lights weren't lined up. The push buttons weren't lined up. And we finally got that change. We finally got enough recognition to say, we are a pedestrian out here. We are a 96 point walk score. We have people on our sidewalks and we need to be able to cross the street without waiting and waiting and waiting. So it does take letting go of your own stories a little bit to, to, to get to some of those things. On Thomas Street, um, it, was, it was that first thing of the east-west connection, but things, don't stop moving. All of a sudden, we have um, we have Seattle Center, and we're going okay. But you know what happens at Seattle Center? Seattle Center, when we have our public, we don't have public marches. We have public gatherings that come because the fountain is the healing place when there's something that happens in the city, and so people come to the Seattle Center fountain and they want to heal there. That's what those marches are about. To have a wonderful corridor to come through instead of zigzagging through all the streets would, would just elevate those types of marches that happen. All of a sudden in our quiet little neighborhood, we're going to have a new arena with a billion dollar infrastructure put in. And we asked the question, what if our traffic was better after the arena was built? Well, people thought we were crazy. How can you do that? Well, every ticket gets an orca pass. All kinds of things happen right now when you start asking those kinds of questions. Thomas Street should be built 
We're in season two of the hockey. They're in the playoffs. It is absolutely crazy that Thomas Creek Youngville, and we don't have a celebration place where people who don't have tickets can gather and do that. So if there's a challenge for me on Thomas Street, is that we let it be Thomas Street, we didn't tie it to a bigger project. We didn't tie it to the arena, we didn't tie it to 99, we have to tie it to Sound Transit, because pretty soon all of our streets are gonna be blocked with construction, so anywhere we can have one of these little things that opens up, we need to have them built and ready to go. Um, and so we had council votes for funding, and then the last city budget, they didn't fund the last two and a half million dollars. So pencils slowed down. Now, we're, we're, we're still working, and it's still getting worked on a lot, <laughs> but we're not there yet. It's not built out, and we've been four years in the making of this. I just don't believe it should be so hard. I think Seattle has to not make it so hard for these things to happen. and different mayors and having to re-educate everybody on every project from starting from day one because we would have showed up at the offices more. <laughs> oh gosh, I think I just wish I'd um, known how much of an opportunity can come when development is already happening and that you don't necessarily have to start from zero. Sometimes you get to start from 50% uh, design. I live with no regrets, so I give it my best. And I have to, uh, what's it? Um, and then, you know, we have a room full of very motivated folk, people here, and so just wondering how can folks here help with your campaigns, push it, take it to the next level? Um, oh, let's do it from here, and then we'll go. And I would say, please get out and walk Thomas Street from Dexter to Fifth. There's nothing you can do better for a piece of real estate than walk it. See it when it looks like some of the before pictures. Imagine what it can be. Write your council person, write your mayor, join your community organization. I mean, it, it does take the village to make these things work, but real estate needs to be walked. Or, or ride a bike. <laughs> I think just use your imagination and think about what you would like to see change along the pipeline corridor that might make you make a different decision uh, to get on a bike or to get on a bus or to take a walk rather than getting in your car. Great. Um, so one, we've got a table over here with sign-up sheet and we would love to have some new members uh, join our team. We're right now, um, once again, in the initial phase of creating this, which, by the way, this is AI. I know Mark was talking about, no, this is not AI. This is AI right now. <laughs> um, and that, you know, with the envisioning, we're looking to set up uh, a couple of test pilots to try to take over the weekend. Um, and I mean, essentially use these barrels that are already there and just block them off. I, I'm pretty sure if y'all seen the orange cones there, I am every single day making sure that those cones are in place so people can have access to the sidewalk. Projects. Can we give a huge round of applause? Right. Working without a net here, no podium. So, Gordon, you're going to have to give me the wink if I miss anything. <laughs> this is so inspiring. Thank you so much, Aditi, uh, Aaron, Yes, and Debbie, and Mark, and Jeff, and myself for such a good job tonight. Truly, <laughs> um, really this is very inspiring. I mean, I think we've learned that pedestrianizing streets is not just lovely, it's also mission critical for our safety and our health and our climate goals and our um, prosperity. This is important work. Um, 
and the good news is, just by being here tonight, you all have contributed to the momentum in realizing this vision. Um, and the challenge is that we have a long way to go. And so, here's where we have to act. So all of us have these program cards, and on this program card is a QR code. Um, and this is where I, I'm going to pause and ask you all to do what you can. Um, it takes you, the QR code takes you to an action page. You can contribute. You can sign up um, to get involved and help power the work that Seattle Neighborhood Greenways does to make these visions a reality in Seattle. It does not happen um, by magic. It's a lot of hard work. And the steady and strong and, and effective advocacy um, it's why we as sponsors are here tonight. It's why we are so excited for all of us to keep going through the Shaping Seattle series to understand the work, get involved in the work, and fuel it. So I will pause while we all do this together. <laughs> I speed ran it, but I have a long last name, so maybe we're all caught up together. Um, this concludes the program portion of the evening, and now it's the really fun part. It's the mix and mingle. So we have some nosh back there um, that I think we've already started into and we should really dive into now. Um, our good friends at Lime are out in the corner. They are just giving away good things. They have helmets over there. Go say hello to them. Um, and most excitingly, everyone you heard up here and everyone who's actually doing this work in the various neighborhoods of Seattle are here at the table. So. Please do spend some time with them, figure out where you can roll up your sleeves and get to work on this stuff. Um, and I do have one request of you all, which is especially those of you at the back, if you are able to help fold up a chair, just to give us a little more mingling room, um, and stack them over on my right, your left, over yonder, that would be most appreciated. Um, but with that, thank you so much for coming out to pedestrianize this. Wonderful to see you all, and I will talk to you back there.